What's up, everyone? We've got another awesome episode of the Yu-Gi-Oh! show. Today, we've got a special guest. Introduce yourself, please, bro. What is up, all of my beautiful dudes and dudettes? This is Darth Nash 6 here on this glorious and wonderful podcast coming from the other side of the pond. How's everybody doing? Great to have you, bro. Great to have you. Thank you, thank you. I, I would say as well, it's interesting. Um, it's interesting. I don't think we've ever brought this up on air, but the amount of creators like that we communicate with that aren't in the uk i think it's actually quite mad isn't it dan um mm, yeah, yeah like, i feel like the majority of creators it's like yeah it's like you said you're so you're in canada maybe almost i am i live 30 you're... minutes away from the border okay, um i'm yeah. in new york oh you're in... oh okay yeah new york okay never mind but it's like <laughs> yeah considering it's it's a bit of a shell shock and so i have a question for you which is so for like for us it's like we're talking to someone in new york that's like ages and ages away if you're talking to someone on the west coast i think i've got it right which is the other side is that like yeah. really far away is it just kind of like oh we're all in america it's all the same how, how is that for you it's really far away like if i'm talking to like slim x team symmetry you know who's based in california that's a four hour difference yeah so it's like it is almost as far to get to their part of california yeah than it is for me to go to london like, I think it's a longer plane trip. Oh, my gosh. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah. So, like, for YCS London, it was actually, it was, like, $800 USD cheaper for me to go to YCS London than it was to go to YCS LA. Sure. Wow. <laughs> what a shock. So, like, plane ticket and hotel and everything was about $800 cheaper than getting a plane to LA and getting a place to stay at in LA. That's and, like, nuts. the plane ride was a little I think it was like two hours less. Huh. Yeah, that's crazy. Do you know what I think I think you know what it is? We we look at we look at maps and we just take it for granted like how big America is like mm. you, you look at a flat map, you just think, oh yes, yeah, it's easy to just jump on a plane and just like fly across America but like that's <laughs> Yeah, it's massive man. Like, that's that's a considerable <laughs> distance. <huh? laughs> to give you guys a, a, like an even crazier idea, it is it is less time for me to drive to Toronto and go to the locals up in Toronto. You know, the locals that like Ruggles or Distant Coder or Team Sam or Triff or Hakuna My Data, all of them. Mm -hmm. Like, it's faster for me to get there than it is for me to go to one of my locals that I go to with crush cards on my side of the border. That doesn't sound very local. <laughs> yeah, that's but Toronto is 30 minutes... Toronto is 30 minutes closer to me than, than Millennium Games, you know, where, like, Crush Cards do all of their, like, yeah. let's go to locals videos. But th this is yeah. even something as well that is really... Because, for example, I hear it often where I hear Americans talking about how, like, they travel, like, yeah, their locals is, like, an hour away, an hour and a half away, and this kind of thing. Like, that's... Ins like, I, I can't lie. I've, that's, like, regional distance for me. I don't think... If a locals is an hour away, I don't think I could do the drive. Like, well, we used to, like, Cannock, which is 30 minutes away from me. That used to be, like, effort. Like, I'll drive to that, and I feel like, whoa... I've really traveled today, guys. <laughs> 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 like, yeah, I, I've, got, I've got a locals. I've got Millennium Games, which is like hour 30, hour 40 or so. And then I've got three locals that are all within 15 minutes of like where my apartment is. And then there used to be another locals that was about 40 minutes away, but they apparently closed down. Excuse me. Gosh. They closed down a few years ago. And I, I like completely missed it, and so I'm kind of sad about that. I like them. Yeah, that, that, that's wow, what a shock. Yeah, I, don't, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know if I'd be able to. I'd have to find someone to drive me around or something. I don't know if I'd be I'd be willing to travel that far. Um, for like damn, America is wild. But then at the same time, your, your locals are probably like, well, I don't know. I'm guessing. How, like, would you say you're consistently, for example, getting more than 20, 25, 30 people? Is it kind of low numbers? Like, so it's like I got a couple locals that it's like you'll get eight. 10 people mm -hmm. and then it's like yeah you're getting around 40 regularly like mm -hmm. if i were to go to my um like saturday locals yeah. it's sometimes we're pushing 50 people mm -hmm. um but then it's like my friday and sunday locals that are close to me yeah um they're like they're around 10 mm -hmm. 10 to 12 people mm -hmm. if i were to go to millennium games on sunday they're regularly around 40 to 50 people Mm. yeah like i'll I oh, say wow. in the uk i know of like two and a half locals that are like that like i'd say brotherhood used to consistently be like 40 to 50 then you've got mm. um, what's the one in nottingham that i always forget that um 
that the mana, mana screw. Yeah, mana uh, screw. Dice, dice. Oh no, no, oh, mana screw. Mana screw. Mana screw is another one that is consistently. Oh, dice, dice, dice. dice, cup, dice, is it? dice, dice yes. mana screw. It's, it's not in them. Or, or it's not in them, right? Not in them below. Yeah, us, yeah. Northamptons above us, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So like, yeah, they're yeah. big as well. And then the last one is the one in Leeds, um, Royal Armory. The guys who do Royal mm. Armory's one. Their 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 locals are usually quite big as well. But other than that. Yeah, well, our locals. It's rare to get a locals of more than twenty people. Like, if we get a twenty people local, it's like, oh, yeah, we're killing it. Yeah, we're kind buzzing in it. We're yeah. buzzing. That's like a regional for us. Yeah, that's like, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, our OTS championship was thirteen people. That was um, that was fun. <laughs> yeah. that, is, that is that is intense competition right there. 100%. <laughs> Yeah, but um, just, sorry, I've I've gotten a bit of a side. Oh, were you about to ask something down before I ask my question? No, no, no. Um, I'm just having a couple I, of technical difficulties here. So I, was, I was just going to ask, uh, Nash. Uh, so you said you go to a, a Wednesday, a Friday, and a Sunday local. So do you make those locals consistently each week, or is it do you kind of like pick and choose between a couple of them? Or I will try and make them as consistent. It was uh, Tuesday, not Wednesday. I'll okay. try and make them as consistently as possible. Um, okay. It, it's like it's just trying to balance it with um like my normal life, I guess you could say. Mm. Um yeah. cuz I've got a job and sometimes I'm working that job until like 6, mm. even 6:30, mm. and on days where I have to leave work late, I can't make it to the locals cuz the locals yeah, start at 6:30. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um so I'll regularly try and go uh to Tuesday, Friday, um Tuesday and Friday are the ones that I really push for. And the Sunday locals, it just opened up. So I'm going to try and go there more often to like support them because they just had their first tournament ever oh, yesterday. Wow. And okay. so I, I, and like they've got this amazing store. They've built, it's this building that they got a hold of that they have turned into a Pokemon Center. Oh, Yo. like they've, they've designed the entire building outside and inside to look like a Poké Center. That's and crazy. I think it's the coolest thing ever. So I want to give them like I, I want to go to them as much as possible because I do not want them to go under. I'm like, this is the mm. coolest location I've ever been to. Mm. Yeah, that's pretty that does sounds hard i think it's important that you mentioned about supporting local businesses as well like especially with locals because i hear a lot of people making the argument like oh it's long to go to locals and sometimes it is long to go to locals but if you don't go to locals locals just go under in it mm -hmm. so support your local game stores yeah, definitely. oh absolutely and the thing with like support your local community it's like mm. this is gonna sound like i'm a linkedin you know influencer <laughs> but it's like your local community, they're like, they're your network within the game. And the more friends you make with the game, the more you can, like, socialize. Mm. And it's always good to have an excuse to socialize, to get yourself out of the house, to interact with people. Um, not only for playtesting, but the more people you play with, the more play styles you learn. And it really affects, like, your cognitive abilities if you can play with so many different people and then you get a group of people that you trust that you can play with you can see so many different ways of playing and so many different ways of looking at the game mm. rather than if you're just at home grinding on dueling book grinding on master duel um testing by yourself you're never gonna do as good as you can if you've got a group of people like you need a group of people to test with and little locals like a local scene is a great way to get that testing ground and even i look at like the smaller 10 15 man locals as like i'm paying five dollars to get three to four rounds of testing in i don't look at it as as a local tournament i look at it as you know an opportunity to get four actual games of testing in yeah. so that i can apply my ideas that i've been thinking about and then you know 20 or more i'm going to take that locals more seriously 100 percent. and I, I i think that's a really really good point as well when it comes to the testing thing because yeah testing in like a in a real life space it's just it's I don't know what it is, but something about it is just so different to like testing at home and stuff. Like it's just it's not the same feeling. Like even little things like testing on DB, like there's some value in that. Definitely, I think testing DB is really good. But I can't compare to like when I actually go to locals, which is why, for example, me it bothers me when I go to locals and there's no one there and it's all because like ah, like it could be so good. Like I could be getting so much better if I was at locals actually testing mm -hmm. with people. And it's fun as well. It's nice. Mm -hmm. Like that's some of the best time I have during the week when I'm hanging out with my mates at locals and it's like. 
Definitely. It's almost like... Oh, sorry. No, no, go on. Go on. And and it's also like, not to completely detract from Yu-Gi-Oh!, but it's so good for your mental health to get out and force yourself to interact with people. Mm -hmm. And I like, I look at it as that way. Like I am, I'm forcing myself to socialize, to get out and interact with other people Mm -hmm. so that I'm not alone in my apartment. Yeah. 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 Mm. Yeah. I think that's a really good point. Um, To be honest, I don't think that's something we've really gone into like into too much detail on the podcast. So I I am going to put a pin in that because that's definitely something I want to come back to later. But Nash, for those people who may not know who you are, could you give us a little bit of an introduction to your channel, please, and your online persona? Absolutely. I am Darth Nash 6. I'm known for two things. One, it's Yerba Mate, which I, I don't remember if we talked about this. Like We did off, off record. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah. So I'm known for Mate, and the second thing that I'm known for is playing dual terminal decks. Um. For those, for the listeners and watchers that don't know what Dual Terminal is, uh, at the start of the 5Ds era, in order to promote Synchro Summoning, what Konami did, or I think it was Upper Deck at the time, this was before Konami, what they did was they created arcade machines that were the Dual Terminals that had a special rarity called the Dual Terminal Printing. And you would put a dollar or a five dollar bill into this machine, and you would get, for each dollar... For each dollar, you would get a card with this dual terminal foiling. Mm -hmm. Now, these dual terminal cards um, introduced new archetypes that are just known as the dual terminal archetypes. They became tournament legal with the release of the Hidden Arsenal sets, which were around the Hidden Arsenal sets in the progression series, if anybody watches uh, Nim Nim and Simo Mm -hmm. on that channel. And they introduced... Mainly they're known for introducing insane extra deck monsters to the game, but and also uh, some of the worst archetypes known to man, Ice Barrier and Ally of Justice. <laughs> um, <laughs> but they've got, like, X-Sabers, uh, Evil Swarms, Constellars, like, big archetypes that have been meta-relevant. Um, we can see uh, Hypnocorn... He's really trying to make Constellar work, and he's been winning OTSs with them. Mm -hmm. Um, They're all really janky archetypes, and I love them because they are what introduced me to the concept of archetypes when I was learning how to play the game for real with my friends in high school. You know, like people talk about playground format. We had study hall format, and what it was is we were just getting all of the Yu-Gi-Oh cards in, like, the entire school that everybody had from when they were kids and we were learning how to play the game we were going to stores and buying card packs and this was when hidden arsenal 4 was starting to come out so we were buying these card packs and we were seeing like oh some of these have the same names oh they work with each other and so it like introduced us to the idea of overarching archetypes and so i got a dragoonity structure deck and i started picking up drac cards and so, like, Dragoonity, that's another, like, that was a meta deck back in around 2011. And so it introduced me to not only archetypes, but the competitive scene of Yu-Gi-Oh! and being able to play through it. And so I've played almost every dual terminal archetype, and I will almost exclusively play dual terminal archetypes. Wow, what a shock. The, the funny thing <laughs> about dual terminal as well is, I, I don't know about you guys, but for me personally, it's like, even though I didn't play during dual terminal, I feel like most of those archetypes are the ones that like like are like most in my head for some reason like they feel like the most iconic cards i mean outside of always like dark magician and like blue eyes but like still it's like they feel like the most iconic ones like yeah i don't know what it is saying about that I don't, is that it is is that just after or just before edison i feel like it's not the same kind of around time period um started coming out around the time of edison yeah like so it's, dual terminal one dual terminal series one and two yeah. And maybe three were out by Edison. Dual Terminal 4 is after Edison. Yeah, so it's, it's, I, like, it's I, crazy. Sorry, now you go, you go. No, I was going to say, I think Dual Terminal like actually was kind of like a little bit of a turning point for the game in general, right? Because one of the things people say that they like about Edison a lot is the fact that um, archetypes are making their own boss monsters. Yeah. Like Black Wings are making Black Wing monsters, what have you. Um, but there's a lot of generic broken boss monsters in Dual Terminal, right? You have like Trishla, Nat Beast, um, Catasta when it's relevant, like at the time was really good. Um, yeah, Brionak, exactly another one. Um 
do look there's another ice barrier one basically all the ice barriers in grows are really good um, uh, yeah <laughs> Dunia, yeah Dumoran, all four they're insane yeah. yeah so i do think actually the dual terminal is probably more important for the progression of the games in the meta than people give it credit for to be honest like thinking about it yeah mm-hmm. definitely I don't know when I when I think of it now as well. Like when I think of Dual Terminal now, and I think of like, oh, when I think of the archetypes that came up then, I can think of the story archetypes now. While the ones now are cool, I definitely think a lot of the stuff that I'm not thinking wrong when I'm thinking Shadol's part of that as well, right? Well, no, I'm Shadol, sure it is. Shadol is part of the um like third era of yeah. Dual Terminal. It was after the Dual Terminal machines, yeah. like Dual Terminal printing of those cards don't exist, but they take place. Within in the, the same yeah. like the universe. universe, yeah, exactly. And it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Again, it's like when I think of those stories, I feel like those stories are so cool. Like the ones now are okay, but like, as I, as much as I like Albers now, uh, I don't think it compares to like like all of the archetypes from there. Aren't they? I think those were a lot. Better. I don't know, like, Dual Terminal is like the multiverse, right? Yeah, it, it, it kind of. It's like um, I think like Visas, the Visas line is more of a multiverse. Yeah. Yeah, story. Sort of thing. Yeah, right. yeah, that yeah. one literally is a multiverse, isn't it? So yeah. Yeah. yeah, I would I would compare like the Albaz storyline as more like the dual terminal with like different tribes and clans mm. and like how they interact with mm. each other. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I get. What, what surprises? Like, oh, sorry, you go, um, you go on. I was gonna say what surprises me about a lot of the dual terminal archetypes. There's it, it the, to me they feel like a question mark next to them because they they were good for their time but i feel like at any point any kind of support could kind of like push them over the edge like mm. x sabers for example like i don't know um we've already seen like naturia do some crazy things like they're just they're just so close apart from ice barriers like i just don't understand what's going on with the main deck monsters in that deck like oh, i will say <laughs> i have won a locals tournament with ice barriers like <laughs> i i've got that on my belt I, I've got yeah. one locals win with ice barriers post structure deck. Post structure deck. <laughs> I, I'm scared to ask how that worked, but <laughs> I, just, I, I don't I just, understand it before post before structure deck. Never mind post structure deck. So <laughs> it wouldn't have done anything if needle fiber wasn't legal at the time. The fact that I could oh, okay. quick play synchro into Trishula repeatedly on my opponent's turn. Um that that's that's what I would do. I would go into Trishula or I'd go into the level eleven Trish Synchro, which just banishes three on my opponent's field. So that's like yeah. I geared the deck towards building up a board to quick play synchro on my opponent's turn and just like interrupt, 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 and then you know, attack with big number. This is what I mean about Ice Farriers though. Their extra deck monsters are so good, but Yeah. How do you fuck up a main archetype like main deck that badly? I the <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. No disrespect meant to any Ice Barrier fans out there, but... All four of them. <laughs> All four of them. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, if, if you're still an Ice Barrier fan at this stage, look, you have to... At a certain point, you have to let go. It's not worth it, man. Don't do that to yourself. <laughs> yeah, like, it's, a painful, it's a painful archetype to be a supporter of. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe Ice Barriers will be good in the upcoming Dune meta. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Medanium Ice Barrier, watch out, bro. <laughs> yeah, well, sp- speaking of which, coming back to something more recent, yeah, that leads on. So, what do we think is go- is the Dune meta is going to be like? I think we're probably about to have a pretty significant meta refresh um, mm-hmm. for the first time since was it Pote was the first one that um, Tier and Sprite came out. Yeah, Pote. Yeah, yeah since Pote, so it's like we're going to have a pretty big change the meta i would say so what do we think guys what do you think it's going to be like what do we think is going to be the good decks all of that stuff yeah um honestly honestly like i haven't given it much thought i've not been playing too competitively over the um over the recent few months just because like i've been a bit format sick but i think we're gonna introduce like pearly's just gonna get way more powerful i think with the trap the traps bonkers rescue ice um i've not heard anyone talk about this deck have you heard of this deck fabs rescue ice andre now rescue rescue ice is going to be good rescue ice is going to be good i'm interested to see if dark world can do some stuff actually because yeah. that starter they got seems to just be like everything they wanted and more right yeah like genuinely like dark it's not even the funny thing is dark corridor is a good card but i wouldn't even say dark corridor is the card that is just amazing the card that's really good is um diabolica the blah 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 from basically there was these two themed 
like generic utility cards. One was um, Catalyzer, Zalamander Catalyzer. One was Diabolical yep. Fiend Commander. And when the new Dark World Shark deck was announced, those two cards in the deck made it so good. And then we got Zalamander, but we didn't get Diabolical. And it was like, oh, when's that coming out? And normally when something's like an OCG exclusive or whatever, that basically means we're never going to get it. Fortunately enough, they released it in Dune, and that card basically that card makes trading actually good. Before trading was like you're discarding bricks, now you're discarding an actual good card. It can like add snow back from the graveyard, which is insane. Um, it's okay. dark as well, so you can run a law like. And what basically the way I look at Dark World now is, you don't really brick. The deck never loses to itself anymore. Now the only <clears> thing you really lose to is Droll and Shifter, which I'm okay with. If the only thing I'm losing to is my opponent having either Droll or Shifter. Uh, yeah, yeah no, that's I, I'm not that I wasn't going to win it anyway. Yeah. 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 <laughs> our last locals, it was hilarious. We had a Manadium player do full Manadium combo. And like, I was standing behind the Dark God player as he was watching. I just saw he had Lava Golem in his hand. And I was like, this is peak. No matter what this <laughs> is, it's a Manadium player pops like bare negates and it's like flipping cards. And you know, it looks so sick. And then it's like, Dark God player's like, cool. He's like, hmm, stand by main. And I was like, why, why, are, you, why are you like BMM4, bro? You oh. know what you're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> like, then he's like, Love Golem. He was like, no, he was, there was a Fenrir, a Baron, and something else. He was like, um, so which one of those two negate? And I was like, why are you asking that question as well? But okay. And he's like, okay, Love Golem. <laughs> Love Golem's those two, reveal danger, discard, and then, yeah, he just completely eviscerates the guy's hand. But, uh, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's deep. Yeah, it's I'd be, I'm interested to see what Dark World does. It's gonna be awesome. um, yeah. I don't know, just... I also, go on, Ash, you go through. I also think with the new spell, we're going to see people starting to use Dark World engines. I agree. I think that's where Doc Crow was better. You're right. Mm, yeah. yeah. Because the thing is, is, I was looking at this on Joshua Smith, and he made up a good point that it is a once per turn. Mm -hmm. And so it in, it in of itself is going to, like, I see it tripping up Dark World decks because Dark World decks can draw their entire deck. And so once you use it, it becomes a dead draw. Yep. And so now I see because of the addition of that card dark world becoming an engine to kind of replace like the danger engine in 2017 100%. i like i see people running a dark world package in their deck to give it a solid like draw turbo through my deck engine yeah. get stuff in the grave even little things like for i i would say I, i'm scared to say this because i know they're gonna do it and i know they hadn't thought of it yet but even pearly for example they were playing dark gold yeah. cards before and it wasn't amazing yeah if i was a pearly player now i would 100 percent play dark free dark crowd or i play like free dark crowd or one cerulean one silver why not yeah you're getting hand looped in flipping in flipping pearly like it's mad so yeah this is yeah. this is gonna be this is gonna be an insane take so you know hold on to your butts oh, I'm ready for it. i think Kashtira is going to be less played in this format, and with the Dark World cards, I can see Tier Element making a rise to the forefront. Definitely. And it's going it's going to be like with Dark World Tier, Cash is going to be played more. And then once Dark World Tier, people are going to play less Cash, and Dark World Tier is going to be played more. And it's it, they're going to be like. Yeah, well, this is how the format's going to yeah. flop back and forth. We're in a really interesting spot now where it's like. People are gonna jump on all the new decks, but cash is still there. Shifter still beats yeah. everything. Yeah, and mm -hmm. then it's like, yeah, it's exactly you said. People are gonna play those decks, and someone's gonna be like, hey. And I, I think it really card. depends. I think it really depends on how much Pearly's gonna blow up because Pearly has an insane cash matchup, and it's only gotten better now. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I, I hope I hope everyone plays Pearly as a rescue ace player. I'd be very happy if everyone decides to, to play Pearly. Yeah. Be a fun game. I know I know we spoke about this uh previously, but I, I do think when something happens to Cash, you'll see more of what we think the meta will be. Like uh, people have been still playing Dragon Link and it dies to like Shifter and Droll, yeah. which is yeah. obviously in the format, but Cash Cash is somewhat gatekeeping it. And I feel like as soon as soon as a rise heart gets hit, which I feel like it's gonna be inevitable just because of his macro effect, we will see like the resurgence of some of those older decks. We all know Pearly's yeah. going to be a, like, a, like a staple. Like I've, there's one guy at my locals that plays Pearly and I played him probably about three weeks in a row. And every time I've played him, I've asked him what his cards are doing. Like he keeps equipping stuff. I just, I can't be bothered to learn the deck. Do you got know I me? And I play Kirikara. So I'm just like, all right, if I've drawn it, I don't, I don't need to know. You get me? I'm just going to Kirikara. But like it does a lot. And then you just, 
I, I didn't respect it before, but now with especially with the Dark Lord engine, I feel like it's going to be doing a lot more than it than it used to. If you got know what I mean, and then mm, obviously it's definitely. got its new um, X Y Z as well, which is just it's silly. So, <laughs> so yeah, Pearly's Pearly's going to be a problem. Yeah, I hundred percent. Yeah, this is what I mean. <laughs> Definitely not. I 100% agree with what you say about a rise hard gatekeep in the format. Like, it feels like that's what's keeping Cash so powerful. If like, mm. I know that Cash is broken, like regardless of the main deck monsters, but like, yeah, a rise hard just gatekeeps the shit out of so many decks. Like, and I, I like um, Manadium, for example. Like, is a deck that and is people are talking about and the Synchron stuff. Um, it's, it, it, they need the graveyard. I think yeah. one thing as well is cash. Another thing as well that was kind of making cash get weaker and weaker is that we were moving into a board breaker format, and cash is horrible into board breakers. But cash is amazing oh, yeah. in a hand trap format, and it's like I don't even—it's not even really cash. Fenrir is amazing in a hand trap format. In the simplified yeah. game state, Fenrir is one of the best cards in the game, and we're going to—I mean, when Manadium and stuff are like calamity locking you, you have to main deck a bunch of hand traps and. If you're in a simplify game state against cash, it's not looking good for you because they're going to keep banishing your cards face down. And if they ever do establish a rise heart, now they're going to be like banishing other cards as well, and you can't access your grave and all of that. And yeah, it's pretty Speak. insane. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Yeah, I'm excited for it though. I think um, we were just talking. Um, so um, Jim Fee was talking about Dogmatica just before this, and for example, that's a deck I would say that is utterly violated by cash Dira. And that's gonna become <laughs> you can't activate your best card. It's like, well, I mean you can activate it, it's not gonna do anything. But I mean it's it's gonna be nice to play decks like that and feel free again, definitely. hundred percent, which uh, does lead me um nicely to a question that I wanted to put specifically to uh Nash and Andre. Uh you're both people who play rogue decks, um but you play them as competitively as you can. Um so I wanna put the question to both of you. Um, what's the thought process in how you pick a rogue deck and making it as viable as possible? Uh, Jimmy Thie, if you want to go first, go for it. Um, okay, so for me, it's it's whatever the gimmick is. So, um, Dogmatica, for example, like I like the idea of the ritual monster um, and just being unaffected because. It, it, Along with along with ripping an extra deck, which is kind of like what Dagmatica does anyway. Maximus was doing it from day dot. From day one, yeah. Another avenue. Um, but having that ritual monster and then going into, I think, what was I playing the other day? The Dagmatica Nexus. So I, resol I resolved Nexus about three or four times now. And like, <laughs> somebody said to me, like, what, what, what's going on here? Why am I dying and burning at the same time? I was like, well... Just, have you have you read this card? Like, <laughs> and that's part of <laughs> that's part of what like I like. It's it's the unpreparedness of my opponent and me just mm -hmm. trying to explain to him what each card does and I, and yeah, depending yeah. on what the gimmick is, it kind of like just it puts me in this zone. Like Ninja Mosquito OTK, for example, that's the whole reason I bought a Sprite deck. Um, I don't play Sprite mm -hmm. no more, but I got to Ninja Mos Mosquito OTK, and uh, to me that just I was just like fascinated by it. Yeah. I was like. I'm gonna kill you with a zero attack monster. Like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? And I think yeah. that's what drives me to try and like just like build these decks and play them as competitively as I can, just to mm. pull off that one, that one gimmick that kind of like wins you the game, kind of thing. So that's just that's where I stand with it. What about you, Nash? Um. So, I. The thing with Rogue is I look at decks with um. What is something about the deck that makes this unfair? And what draws me to older cards is that they don't have hard once-per-turn clauses on them. The lack of a hard once-per-turn in and of itself is unfair in the modern game of Yu-Gi-Oh! So I look at those and I'm like, okay, what's something that those archetypes have or those cards have that they can do that's also unfair? Like for X-Sabers, for example, I look at double X-Saber Gotham's, it's a hand rip. That is, that is unfair in the game of Yu-Gi-Oh! I look at, you know, the Ice Barrier cards. Trishula, non-targeting, banish three, up to three. That's not fair in the game of Yu-Gi-Oh. I'm messing around with Fabled right now, and they've got a card called the Fabled Unicorn, where if you've yep. got the same amount of cards in your hand as your opponent, you can just blanket and negate anything. Your your opponent cannot activate stuff, because mm -hmm. um, it just gets negated. That's not fair. Um, they've got another Synchro, Fabled Rajin. You just draw two cards on Summon. That's not fair. I could just, I could, a free draw to, like a... That's Pot of Greed with a 2300 attack body. Like, that's awesome. Um, 
other decks that I played. I played Evil Swarm Kashtira at YCS Philadelphia. Evil Swarm Ophion and Steel Swarm Origin are very unfair cards. Evil Swarm Ophion is a floodgate that searches like an in archetypal forbidden lance, mm -hmm. and Steel Swarm Origin forces you to play Master Rule Four. It turns Master Rule 5 back into Master Rule 4. <laughs> <It> does, <yeah. laughs> only summon extra deck monsters to an arrow it points to. Even if you summon a Link monster with an arrow, that arrow doesn't matter. You have to summon it to the point that Steel Swarm Origin points to. And so, like, during Super Heavy Samurai, they would go, you know, Super Heavy Samurai Scareclaw, or Scareclaw, Scarecrow, or Cleefort Genius, they'd have to summon it under Steel Swarm Origin, and they're shut off. Um, like... Kashtira or Rise Art, while we're talking right now, that macro effect, that's not fair. And so that's why I look at all of the dual terminal archetypes, because none of them have hard once per turns on them. Dragoonity. The fact that Dragoonity mm. Phalanx is a tuner that can summon itself over and over and over and over again, that's not fair. Dragoonity was Dragon Link before the idea of Dragon Link was thought up of. Mm -hmm. So I mm. love playing it, like even um, Mist Valley. I was playing Mist Valley for a bit because Mist Valley Apex Avion is not a fair card. It's just bounce a Mist Valley card to hand, negate. Non once per turn, non once per chain, negate. That's like that's beautiful. And so I love playing those decks where I really have to think and I'm like, okay, this deck does something unfair. How can I actually make this consistently unfair? What can I do to make it consistent so that I can play? this deck from 10 years ago right now that's such a it's interesting when you say that's how you think because that's such a competitive mindset that you've applied to rogue mm -hmm. decks like when you um what was his name um jesse cotton he was doing so jesse cotton did a video ages ago about it was the insect there's an insect level eight synchro that that's mad thing and he said almost exactly what you said about how he was like the idea is that he's trying to do something he's trying he looked at the insect card and the first thing he thought is what is unique about insects and how can i break it so it's so interesting that your mindset is it's almost exactly the same as his but i can see why it works for you so it's like i can see why it works because it's like yeah you're doing the same thing but you're just doing it with more obscure cards and i guess you also have that advantage of people coming in there like no uh, what's going on Funny you mentioned the, the Diablanta Synchro. That's that it, yeah. Synchro that Synchro is the reason I took Naturia Punk to YCS London. Okay. The existence of that card. Because I knew that Punk without my normal summon could go into that Synchro, send Mole Cricket to the grave. I could normal summon Naturia Camellia, and I could get full combo. Freaking or good. I could get Naturia combo, and then I could use my normal summon for Naturia Bamboo Shoot. Oh yeah, which is also uh, <laughs> that card's busted. Yeah, which is a very <laughs> unfair card. It's not that in the gates you just cannot activate. It's like, yeah. oh, you want to activate Dark Ruler? You can't. Yeah, it's not, it's not. <laughs> you cannot activate Super Palmerization. Oh my gosh, yeah. So, uh, kind of as a follow up, then, if you were to say your top three favorite rogue strategies that you've kind of cooked up, what would they be? Um, so my first one that I actually saw success with was during Dragon Ruler format. I brought Jirax. And the reason I brought Jirax was because they could use Blaster, Dragon Ruler of Inferno, and their main Synchro was a level 7. Sorry, I'm so sorry. And I, so, I, how do I spell Jirax? I'm, I'm not familiar with this. Uh, J-U-R-R-A-C. <laughs> Jirax. Okay. So the fire, like, dinosaur archetype. Oh, yeah, no, no. Aeolo is the most popular one, isn't it? I've yeah, never seen these Aeolo. cards in my life. What the heck yeah. is that? Aeolo, Aeolo was played in dinos before because it was, um, we were thinking for a long time, it was the only level one dino tuner, wasn't it? Yeah. Sorry, Nash, carry on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> learning, bro. I'm learning. <laughs> so it was a blind going second deck. Or, like, I also made it so that, like, I could go first and I would set up. And um, the end board would be Draco Sack with a double Dolka. Wow. Mm. And Wait, so what? Dolka... In 2013? That's broken? Yeah, yeah. So that that was the normal board that I would end on because you could also because of Jirak Aeolo, a fire with two hundred defense, I could play Rekindling. Rekindling, yeah, yeah. And the burner, the baby dragon ruler, the baby fire, is also two hundred defense. Yo. Yeah, this is And so I would just it would like I would have, you know, like 
I would load up my grave with everything. I'd drop a rekindling to bring out all of my Aeolos. Mm -hmm. I'd go into like Drac Guaiba, Drac Dino, all that stuff. I would I main decked Ojama Trio because I could summon the token, attack into the token with Drag Guaiba to trigger Drag Guaiba to summon Drag Velo to overlay main phase two into Adolka. And so I'd get out two Guaibas and like it, it was so easy. It was so easy to get into all of this. And then if all else failed, Jirak Giganoto increases every Jirak monster on the field by like two or three hundred attack for each Jirak in the grave. And so if you got two Jirak Giganoto out, they would stack on top of each other. I once attacked for game with 12,000 attack. Um, oh just gosh. because you like, I'd get out two Jirak Giganoto and they'd overlap on each other and it was beautiful. So that that was like, I loved that. I loved that so much. Um, I'm, I'm actually speechless. There's like, yeah, I, I, like I love Dragon <laughs> Ruler format. Like, that's one of my favorite retroactive formats. And like, right now, I'm just imagining like you cooking this up, and you're just like that that meme of the guy who's sitting on his own brain. Like, it's so that's <laughs> colossal. I, I I made it to day two of YCS Toronto with Jirak. What a shock! Wow. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking at this you... archetype. This is. I mean, I can confirm it does not Wild. look like a good archetype when I just look at it. So the fact that you made it to day two of this, I'm, I'm very impressed. Wow, what a shot! It was that. That's like that's my baby. I love that. I do not think that Drek will ever be playable ever again. It, it stopped being a viable solution once Duelist Alliance came out. Mm. Like that. That's the wall. It cannot get past that wall. Um, mm. Other things that I really loved. I was using. Um, Dragoonity. Dragoonity was my yeah. first actual deck, and I've kept with it for a while. Uh, beginning of last year, so like um, uh, when like Dawn of Majesty, Battle of Chaos, when those came out, mm -hmm. um, both those sets back to back, I went undefeated at all of the sneak peeks that I went to with a blind second Dragoonity deck. Wow. Um, just because of Dragoonity Whirlwind, which is essentially yeah. Tri-Brigade Revolt for Dragoonity. Crazy. That and is. so... Yeah. So you could get a Black Rose Dragon on the draw phase and yeah. nuke the whole board and then you'd be you'd be good to go from there, like full combo and it was it was beautiful. You could I once so I once drove down to Arizona for a case tournament. Um and I was able to OTK the same turn that I activated Pot of Prosperity. Freaking heck. <laughs> <laughs> I feel nah, very. Sure, if sure, I was your opponent, I'll be offended. I'll be so offended if that happens. To me. <laughs> like, what's going on? I'm not supposed to die this turn. <laughs> it, it was funny because um, Neshi, like the Crystal Beast guy, was at this tournament and he was sitting next to me. And I'm going through it. I'm like, oh, I'm going to OTK this guy. And the dude was like, yeah, but you activated Pot of Prosperity. And Neshi, uh, uh, Nick, he's sitting next to me and he's just like, hold up. I want to see Nash cook. I want to see where we're going from here. <laughs> and it was like, it was beautiful. It was a wonderful experience. Oh, yeah, no Nash, I can imagine him doing that, man. That is <laughs> You're so sick, Nash. What the yeah, fuck? Is <laughs> um, I was doing a X Saber Tri Brigade for a while uh, because I had found out a way to do the X Saber Gotham's hand rip mm -hmm. and then end on an Achuria Beast with an Apoloza. What? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and so what was what was awesome about it was that um so I like I don't know if I want to like you know steal anybody's thunder but I first kind of grasped the importance of Shurig not as like a boss like an end boss mm -hmm. but as a combo extender because I would use Shurig to search rescue cat and mm -hmm. um use rescue cat off the Farajit special summon and I would get out like X Saber Air Bellum, Double X Saber Dark Soul, and I would use all of that um, and be able to like search uh, Double X Saber Fall Troll, Double X Saber Bogart Knight, all that kind of stuff. And um, so being able, I would always be able to hand rip for like three to five and then end on um, a three mat Opelousa with an Acheria Beast with a set Tri Brigade Revolt. And then I would be able to have Double X Saber Dark Souls in my grave. Because what was awesome is I would always summon the two double Epic Saber Dark Soul off of Tri Brigade Revolt, so they'd go back to the grave and their effect would be triggered so that during my end phase, I'd have either the last pieces I needed for a Gotham's Hand Rip for the turn three, or I'd have discard fodder for Tri Brigade Karis. And it was like a constant recurring, it was a self replacing engine. 
and it was it, like, it, I love that. I played that for months. I don't, I don't know about anybody else, but like, I'm listening to you speak, and I'm I'm just trying to work out how like <laughs> how do you get to these games? <laughs> <It's something laughs> in, I don't understand like why. <laughs> Like, how do you get to that point where you've got to a free my Apollosa, a Naturia Beast, Revolt, you've ripped three cards out of somebody's hand? I'm like, I'm struggling. Yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy. That is. This and, um, is actually insane. This is quite rattling. Um, but honestly, my like my most recent baby that I'm super proud of was the Evil Swarm Cashtira deck that I took mm. to YCS Philadelphia. So I first started taking ca- uh, Evil Swarm. Um, seriously, in an unironic way, uh, last year, last May, during like Sword Soul branded format, you know, when the Therions just came out. Um, yeah, pre Pote, right? Little... Yeah, yeah, like last set before Pote. It was it was May. Mm-hmm. Um, um, oh, what was the set? Uh, Dimension uh, Force. Dimension Force. Yeah, that uh, Deer Note came out in. Um, mm. And so I remember looking at the format. And with some of my friends, I was like, guys, I think Evil Swarm Ophion, like, unironically is a good meta call right now because Brandon can't do anything. You yeah. search the spell trap protection, um, and, like, and, like, the only thing is I need something to deal with the Tenyi cards in Sword Soul because they can bounce Ophion. And then I realized that the Adventurer package like, actually worked with it, um, the only thing I needed to do was to get out Griffin Rider before I went into Ophion, because I wouldn't be able to special Griffin Rider again. And um, so what I was thinking about it was, oh, Evil Swarm Heliotrope is a normal monster, so the Adventure Equip spell also works to that and can use its bounce effect since it's equipped to a normal monster. And um, so I took that to YCS Hartford. Due to misplays, I did not do well, Um, not that the deck didn't do well. It was like, it was purely because I, and I, I still can remember every misplay that I did that caused me to not perform well because I've had other people play with the deck and they're like, no, this deck is insane. So I took adventure evil swarm. And then for this, for YCS Philadelphia, I was like, I think evil swarm might be the play again, because the only deck that it doesn't do anything against is pearly that's the only deck that does not care and um i also so i was like okay evil swarm ophion kashtira arise heart i can get out ophion by the fifth summon mm. so i'll be set then i can special summon arise heart uh, uh, rise heart which special summons is a level four to turn itself into a level seven i was like i can work around ophion and then against the super heavy samurai matchup i'll just go into steel swarm origin pointing at arise heart so that Arise Heart has targeting and destruction prevention due to Steel Swarm Origin, and my opponent, if I'm going against a Link Spam deck like Sprite, they are stuck with one extra monster zone. That's it. They can not They can only play with one. And that shuts down Super Heavy Samurai, shuts down all of the Sprite variants. Uh, Runic can't touch any of it, so I was like, I'm, I'm set. I'm good. And I did... I got my third loss round seven. And um, I decided to not continue because I'd realized I hadn't eaten anything at all that day. And so that's why I left. But it was, I loved that deck. It was, I was like, wow, this is way more fun than I gave it credit for. Absolutely insane, gosh. Yeah, taking these decks out there, fair ratings to you as well to go into tournaments and actually taking these kind of decks. Even the fact that you've fought that deeply into theory, like I would just look at the card and I'd be like, oh yeah, I guess. I guess it doesn't work, it's not meta, but you've kind of gone deeply, you've explored it, you've like figured out how it cracks the meta, so yeah, really fair play to you, bro, that's that's so solid, to be honest. Um, thank you, thank you. Like, I've played Gen X, I've played Mist Valley, I've played Ice Barrier, um, I'm unironically going to be playing Ally of Justice the moment I hit 2,000 subscribers on my YouTube, um, I know that the tournament won't be good, it'll be a terrible <laughs> tournament run. But like <laughs> I've, I've made that promise that I hit two thousand. The very next regionals or YCS, I will take Ally of Justice. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh! <laughs> you know, I'm excited to see it. I'm excited to see Ally. Uh, yeah, 100%. Do you see yourself ever playing like a full meta deck? It, no. So there is one time in my life that I played a full meta deck. I played Danger Dark World FTK. Um, the reason that I played it. The reason I played it, it wasn't because I was like, 
<laughs> this is a meta deck. Um, what I had done was I had discovered months beforehand how to do that same combo, but with wind-ups. And I used wind-up bat to create a loop. So wind-up bat, I'd put it in defense position to add wind-up bat to hand, tribute it with cannon soldier, trigger firewall dragon, special summon wind-up bat, wind-up bat in defense position, add wind-up, ow, add wind-up bat to hand, and I would do that, and I was tearing up my locals with it. A lot of people were not a fan of me, but they also, like, gave respect. They're like, alright, you're doing this with wind-up, you know, like, yeah. I see what you're doing. <laughs> um, and, and it was funny because if I knew that they were siding to stop the burn mm -hmm. combo, like the, the FTK, I would side into the wind-up hand rip because I knew how to do it. And so I would just rip their hand with wind-up hunter and then, like, leave, you know, like, one or two negates on board. And they were like, awesome. This is so <laughs> cool. I can't do Not anything. Nash is out here doing wind-up hand loops in 2018. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This was, is... This is a mad thing. <laughs> um, but so that tournament, it was it was a Las Vegas regionals. They had like 400 people. I took Danger Dark World FTK. That was the least fun I had ever had at a tournament in my entire life. Mm -hmm. I was like, I I hated it because I wasn't having a good time. Um, because everybody knew what the deck did, yeah. so they knew how to stop it, and it was like it, that was kind of it, like. Everybody knew how the deck was playing. They knew how to stop it. Mm -hmm. Or I didn't like seeing people like shut down in front of me the mm -hmm. moment yeah. they knew that the FTK was happening. Yeah. It's like it wasn't fun because I knew that the other person opposite me wasn't having a good time because they knew what was happening and they weren't having a good time. Like with the rogue decks, yes, I'm going to do something sacky. I'm going to do something unfair. But people are usually excited to see what I'm doing. They're like, whoa, I want to watch this because I've never seen this before. And yeah. every match that I have with every rogue deck, they're like, hey, you like, you got the win, but that was cool. Like, I enjoyed yeah. watching that or like the back and forth. They were like, that was so cool to see. They're like, they're excited at the end of it. It's like, I've reinvigorated their enjoyment of the game because they just saw something never happen before. Mm -hmm. And I like... I like getting people excited about the game, even if I'm beating them, which sounds really full of myself. And I don't <laughs> like how I worded that, I guess. But it's like with the danger dark, with the meta decks, it's people are like, oh, OK. Yeah. And, and yeah. I hate that. I get I hate it. I, making I think, people not excited. I think that's something that, that I really value as well. And it hits home to me when I my record at like locals or like a regional is the same as someone playing a meta deck like mm. i just like, x2 drop but then so did you but you was playing fluent the reason you didn't enjoy yourself whereas <laughs> yeah. i was just doing something weird and my opponent's watching me with his with a big smile in his face thinking to himself wow like, this, this is, is crazy so cool. like, yeah. what are you doing like you know i got ftk'd by um blaze phoenix the other week like and i put it on my channel and literally Videos i put a few pages well, I just I, I sat there watching it. I was just laughing. I was like, I can't like how you how have you got to this point? <laughs> what are you doing here? Yeah? Do you know what I mean? And that was his only win. Like, <laughs> but he was so happy with it. And I thought, you know what? This is this is why I play the game. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And then I'm sitting next yeah. to somebody who was playing like Cash Tira, and he just, he just went next to anyway. And he was just sitting there like, all right, I just lost. <laughs> yeah, I will admit, losing with losing with Meta sometimes is yeah. very frustrating that's like, it's, I, it's, when it's I went deep. to um, what was it called uh, whatever the last um, European um, tournament Euros when I went to Euros um, yeah I was playing Kashtira and like like round one my deck I just bricked like literally so I was playing the Scareclaw um, field spell and the Scareclaw Kashtira and, and so I opened Scareclaw field spell Big Bang and Scareclaw <laughs> Kashtira three games in a row I was like, oh, flip's sake, like, I've paid money and I'm here. And this deck is supposed to just win by itself and it's really not. I'll, <laughs> I'll sup. So I was thinking, oh, what the heck? So, yeah, I, def I definitely agree. Whereas when I play Rogue, I took Abyss Actors um, to locals, like, a couple months back. Yeah, I, don't, I didn't care. Like, I lost every game. I didn't care. I was just having fun. My opponent, it was the same thing. Like, I was resolving Abyss Actors having, like, a draw five where they make you yeah, yeah. card and they draw five. And, like, just resolving that once, like, made the whole locals to me. Like, I had a great time, so... Yeah, no, definitely. Like, I think people sh people like to shit on rogue players a lot, but I actually, and I think 
speaking to Nash has actually just like kind of like reconfirmed this for me. The, the a lot of the rogue players that we have on the show, Fabs, and I don't know if you'll agree with me here, they they actually have like some of the most nuanced takes when it comes to actually understanding the game. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Like because yeah. I think with a rogue deck it's like um and feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but I always see it from the perspective of like, okay, you don't have to worry so much about the meta um, and how it's going to come. You have to worry just more about, like, focus more on what you're doing, I guess, if uh, that makes sense. I actually wouldn't agree with that. I feel like, I would, I feel like I've worded that badly, yeah, to be honest. Like, I would say it the other way almost, where it's like, when I'm playing a meta deck, I feel like I need to know every other deck very well because my deck's good enough that it's going to win matchups by itself. Like, Kashtira is, I think, the perfect example. I don't really need to know Kashtira super well. Most of the time, a Rice Hot Pass is going to win me the game, or Shifter is going to win me the mm. game. But one of the piece of advice I actually always give people playing rogue decks is that you need to know the meta decks better than them, because they're not going to know your deck well. So if you know their deck well and you know how your deck what decks win con applies to their deck, then you're likely yeah, yeah. to take those matchups for free. So like, I think that's what yeah, that's yeah. why I think they have those nuanced takes because they have to know that. It's kind of like a, yeah, yeah. Like, Nash yeah, has I think before, right? Like, um, how it's like he knew mm. exactly how Evil Swarm is going to win when um, Evil Swarm, Steel Swarm Origin is going to win this matchup, that matchup, that matchup. So it's like knowing the meta really well. Yeah, yeah, that's what like I think I meant to say, but I didn't think I just worded it mm. god awfully. <laughs> like, so thank you for it's clarifying like, that for me, Fabs. Yeah, yeah, like nice. <laughs> there's a reason why hand information cards get banned because mm -hmm. information is so important in the game of Yu Gi Oh! Yeah. And so that's why, not like the average rogue player but like good rogue players already have a leg up against the other people in the room because they know how every deck that they're going to go up against yeah. works whereas their opponent has no idea how their deck is going to work yeah mm. i agree I thought that's what wins me a lot of matches because I, I know where decks are going so i'm already prepared for like what's coming like if i play a rescue ace now thanks to fabs i know exactly <laughs> i know exactly where the interactions lie do you got know i mean and i, I it's the same with your deck. Like, if you're having to explain a card to your opponent, you're already ahead in the game. Yeah. Because there's no way that they can register information that quickly whilst you're comboing and then try and make an informed decision. Do you know what I mean? And I think that's another reason why I, I like to play Rogue because they're having to think on their feet, whereas I'm just sitting there very, very comfortably making some weird ass combo and they're just like okay where's this going yeah, like and then the, i'm like oh, the best what? five words you want to hear when you're playing a road deck is what does that card do when i hear yeah. that, like, <laughs> yeah. i'll tell you what it does yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it wins me the game yeah yeah definitely yeah, yeah it's a good feeling that's how, that's how i felt the first time i used to so i used to be really on ignista and i remember when i brought it to a uh what's it called uh was it no it was an ots championship it was back in prank kids format and yeah absolutely no one at all in like my whole locals knew how igniston worked so it's just awesome like i just it's like they would let me combo and stuff thinking oh it's okay i'll just let him combo and nib him at the end and then suddenly a rival comes out it's like well he can't nib that so <laughs> yeah you should nib <laughs> earlier yeah it's a good and then it's like the field spells I, I well. have... yeah oh sorry carry on Nash. <laughs> i have a friend who uh one time we we traveled to this huge tournament um it was like a multi-case tournament like the winner got like four cases of um sure. first destiny and so he faced like the cockiest adagnister player like full combo full combo yeah. and he was like Are you scoop now because like you can't beat it and my friend was like he's looking at his hand and he's just like no i'm pretty sure i've got an answer and he's like what what answer do you have and he was like uh, special summon cyber dragon contact fuse. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh, that's the painful one. Yeah, yeah, that's the painful one. Oh gosh, yeah, deep, <laughs> deep. it's traumatizing. And the worst thing about that as well is like Ignista literally can't do it because they have Hiari in Grave to Nate stuff, but it's like you literally can't do anything against that. Like if they contact fuse, you just lose, mm -hmm. and it's like your Ignista's mm -hmm. gone. You've got a wide open board. You've probably lost twenty three hundred life points from your your searcher. Like. Uh, yeah. It is the deepest thing you can do yeah. to an Ignista player. It's just special yeah. a Cyber Dragon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of happy. That's one thing I will say. I'm kind of happy that there aren't too many Cyber Dragon players like running around. Um, yeah, it would it would make me sad if they were doing that to my Ignista more often. Mm. Yeah, but um, before we're actually we're gonna go into our Am I the Arsehole? So has anyone got a last topic before we move into that? Um. 
ha- I do have one, but I think it's a little. We're probably gonna need a little bit more time, I so mean, I think I'll save it. You sure you don't want to flow with it? We can flow with it. I mean, no, no, no. I think it's it's, it's something that's a little bit more nuanced. I think yeah. so. We'll save it for like another episode. I think. No problem. No problem. So Nash, how familiar? How familiar? I don't know. I'm having my tongue there. I was doing. I was doing bits. But how familiar are you with the subreddit? Am I the asshole? I've I've heard legends on it of the open seas. Um, <laughs> it, like I'll sometimes see stuff pop up on Facebook. Um, it, it's it's yeah. I I am familiar with it. I've never actually gone to the subreddit, but I've read some of them before. Okay, yeah. So yeah, it's a pretty good subreddit. We always do a question at the end. Well, I say we always. We usually do a question, and um, I've had a couple. So side side note before I go into it. So. If we know about, do you all know about the Reddit drama about um, the Reddit API drama and how they um, basically are charging loads for API calls and so all the Reddit. Yeah, yeah, half the site went down, right? Yeah, well, yes, yeah, so, <laughs> yeah. So um, obviously because of that, like I used to use the Reddit as one app on my phone, and when this drama came out, I I didn't use the Reddit app to start off with because the official Reddit app because it was trash, like the UI was really painful. But as a result of that API change, I've had to download it. And one thing I will say to its credit, and I, I, the reason I'm saying this because I actually think it's relevant, just to admit that I was wrong, is the app is very good at suggesting things that I'm interested in. Um, so I get Am I the Assholes and they'll just pop up on my phone throughout random the day. And so I have a list of like five or six, which are quite nice. Nice. Yeah. But um, this is going to be the one that we're going to do. And it's a, it's, I think it's an interesting one. So it's Am I the Asshole for asking a girl I'm seeing about her period? Um, I think this is an interesting one. Let's run the scenario. RJ looked at me like I'm mad, but look, I I think this is interesting, so I'm going to ask this one. Yeah, I think it's Let's good. run it, let's run it. All right, so, a girl I'm seeing slept over the other night. <laughs> okay, he's, he's throwing me off. He's throwing me off. A girl I'm seeing slept over the other night, and when she was here, stuff got a little sexual. She ended up saying mm-hmm. she was on her period. No big deal. I gave her a back rub, and we watched movies the rest of the night. The next morning, she was getting ready to go home. I went to the bathroom and my garbage was empty and I didn't see her get up a single time to change her pad or tampon. So I questioned her about it and told her if I made her uncomfortable when I was making sexual advances, she could have just said so and didn't need to lie about being on a period. She got defensive and said she had no reason to lie. I told her I saw nothing that indicated she changed her tampon or pad that night. So if she left a tampon in all night for fear of leaving it in my garbage. I didn't care, and I have sisters, and I understand the dangers of using the same tampon all night. She said she was aware and didn't need me to mansplain periods to her, and she called me weird and weird. She blocked me on everything, and it feels very overdramatic. I was just looking out for her. Am I the arsehole? Uh, I'm just going to get a few facts up here before I form my opinion. <laughs> Yo! <laughs> uh, that's... Yo. Do you know why this one? Yo. This one made me laugh Sorry. because I've never seen so many blunders in, in like in one paragraph of all. Sorry, Dan, you go for it. I was going to say, um, for anyone interested, um, according to Google.com, the optimum time for tampon change is every four to eight hours to avoid toxic shock, which, if you didn't know, can kill you. Yeah. Yeah. So, but yeah, I'm, that, that I'm gonna say, might go on. I'm going to say that he's still the asshole. <laughs> Because he's making a big deal out of, like, almost, like, it's like, bro, it's not your place to talk to her about this stuff. Like, last, you know, like, not every guy has a penis, not every woman has a vagina sort of thing, you know? But it's like, dude, if you don't go through a period, you don't have to ask her about her period. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not like it's taboo or anything, but it's like it's not your place, my guy. Mm-hmm. You know, like if you're yeah. like it's it's almost like he's like, Okay, I wanna have sex with you and um I just uh saw that um there wasn't a tampon in my trash, so um <laughs> ma'am <laughs> were you milady, were you lying about being on a period because you spurned my sex because obviously you wanted to have sex with me, so it's like, like that's how I'm looking at it, you know. <laughs> yeah. I think that's that's why I was giggling because, like, it, as the as the I, am I the asshole went on, I just thought you're just getting more and more like an asshole. Like, yeah, when did yeah. you become a detective? Like, why why are you investigating how long? Like, <laughs> he's checking the trash and them kind of things. Like, 
Okay, she hasn't like, she hasn't got rid of the trash, so that means she yeah. must like his that's going through his okay, head. Four. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, bro, like why she's giving you an answer, you gave her a back rub, and you watch the film, like just be happy with the evening. Do you know what I mean? You know what the worst bit about this is? When Fab said she, she said she was on a period. I said, no worries. Give her a back rub and watch films. I was like, okay, he's a, you know, a gentleman awesome. in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Good, good for you. You know, like, strong way to sort of carry it. And then in the morning, he just, just fucks it. Just throws it out the window. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't the asshole until he became the asshole. Yeah, see, the, the funny yeah, thing yeah, is, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think she probably was lying about being on a period because he seems like an idiot and a creep. So that's probably why she didn't want to have sex with him. And so she started lying. That's that's what I thought. At first I was like, okay, like she's on her period. She doesn't want to do it with you. And then it's like, I checked my trash. And then I asked her, like, there was no period. There was yeah. no tampon in my garbage. I was thinking, yeah, you seem mad. I'm sure she's just thinking, I don't want to get murdered by this guy. He's already showing warning signs. You know what? Yeah. I'll just say I'm on my period so we're not bumping. And then look, I ain't never seen it's this like- again. Yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, like, she was on her period. Oh no, she got a vibe from that guy. Yeah. Like, and he did not pass the vibe check. That's exactly. What I think. So, I think you. I think he's on it. I think his detective skills are probably very strong. She probably wasn't on her period, but I think it, you're it's like, bro, you're not L from Death Note. Like, calm down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, I just, and like, even if she was like, I just, I, I could never imagine in questioning someone so far. Like most. Uh, I don't think this is like, I don't think I'm assuming this. I think most girls find their period kind of uncomfortable and embarrassing to talk about. Like, even, like, oh gosh, she's probably killed me. Actually, she won't kill me. I think she won't care. Even my wife, it doesn't find her period like the best subject in the world. Like, we don't rapidly discuss it. I, I don't question about her about it on a daily basis. Let alone oh. a girl that I'm on a date with. Like, do you get it? No. Like, that's, that's like not a thing. Like, uh, this yeah, I was just seeing blunder after blunder. I was like, this guy, you got zero yeah. game, bro. Zero game. Like, and, if, and if that like, was the first date, yeah, at my seat. Well, actually, you know what? Let me be right. He didn't actually say first date. He said a girl I'm seeing, but seeing to me implies okay. they're not in a relationship. Which yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and I, they may not have they may not have had sex before. Yeah, like outside of my family, even my sisters, to be honest. The amount of girls that I've had discussions with their periods with is is like zero point five, and like the point five is my wife, and we barely discuss it. So yeah, yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't consider myself to be like a um sort of bank of knowledge of periods. Hence the googling of the facts earlier to make sure that you know we were all on the right page. <laughs> but yeah, the thing is, like, even if she did lie, like, so what? Yeah. Like, you 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 took an L, you redeemed it, might I add. Like yeah, and you might you might have been able to get yourself a little bit of coochie in the future had you not decided to play Professor Layton all night. <laughs> like he's a dickhead, bro. He's an idiot. Actual... But he'd, he'd, he'd make a good employee, I'll tell you that. Because he he does <laughs> yeah. things thoroughly. Nothing slipping by this guy. Your employee, no, your employee, no stone is going unturned. Literally, it's like you call in sick to work, this guy's outside your door, he's like, hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's like it's like I I don't know if this exposes me as a normie or anything, but it's like that episode of The Office. Where Oscar calls in sick and Dwight yes. like <laughs> investigates everything, and then he sees that Oscar's come home from a date with a man, and he's like, "I knew you were lying," but he does not understand <laughs> that like he's discovered that Oscar's gay. He's just been just like, "You were lying about being sick." <laughs> this guy is like, this guy is like the teacher that everyone hated at school. Oh hundred percent. Yes. Yeah, hundred percent. Well, guy. Mm-hmm. Well, guy. So this guy, yeah. yeah, yeah, he's a mug. He's a mug. Just um, he's a yeah. For 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 any, anyone watching this who um, yeah, has if a girl ever tells you she's on her period, the only question you need to ask is, do you need me to buy you something? Do you need me to buy some ice cream? Do you need to buy some cookies? What can I do <laughs> to make you feel more yeah. comfortable? Beyond that, Straight fact. assume assume that it's not the first period she's having. Even if it is, assume it's not. And assume if it's you the probably fir- don't know better than her. Assume. If it's the first period she's having, then bro, you need to not be seeing someone who's only just having <laughs> yeah. that period. Well, no, yeah. we could, you never know. We could have some like 11, it's like 11, 12, one. Is that even, I don't even know what age, but it's like we could have some 11, 12 year old viewers, which they shouldn't be watching anyway. We talk about mad stuff on the show. So yeah, if yeah, you yeah. have 11, 12 year old viewers, stop watching. Yeah, actually, no. Stop yeah, don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> But anyway, on, yes. that <laughs> on that lovely note, uh, we are going to yeah, give us the YouTube revenue. All right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Don't 
don't watch us, just turn the sound off and like play us in the background on a loop. So we yeah, yeah, I yeah. decided that was a very prominent YouTuber that the, the inspiration for this podcast, he used to say that. He was like, put my videos on, click the playlist, and then just go to school. He was like, just, yeah, he's like, just, go to school, just leave on the playlist and let it run. <laughs> so, you yeah, know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, um, if you pay your own electricity bills, then feel free to do that. If you don't, then uh, allow your parents, man. That's a bit rough. But anyway, yeah. Guys, <laughs> so, on that note, we're going to be closing off this episode of the Yu Gi Oh show. Thank you so much, Nash, for coming on. Have you got any shout outs, anything you want to say before we close up? Um, Shout out to all of my friends in Utah that helped me get back into the game. Mm. Shout out to the Buffalo community. They are my local scene right now. Um, shout out to all of my friends that are out there in the game. I've got Crush Cards, Distant Coder. I've got Ruggles. I've got Dan Kirby, Bean Soldier, um, uh, the, the Caleb.exe, uh, King Scarlet YGO. They're all my homies. I love them all. Love you guys. Loving it, loving it, loving it. Thank you love, so much. All right, we'll see Thank you guys you. all in a bit. Peace.